And I'm also the organizer and founder of a group that started out being called Silicon Valley Ag Tech, because we started it up in Menlo Park, uh, Palo Alto actually, but it has since grown. It grew uh, almost immediately to, uh, to a Bay Area Ag Tech and then a California Ag Tech. Now we're doing these events all over the West Coast, and in fact, we're spreading uh, to Chicago uh, in November, and we expect to be doing conferences and events internationally. Uh, by uh, Q1 of next year. So we've been riding this wave. I started this group about four years ago, the Egg Tech Group, and uh, since then it has, it has really exploded. And it's great to be down here in San Diego to talk about it down here. You know, I didn't know this before, but you know, probably the highest number of family farms, small farms, are located in San Diego County. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear more about that from our panel tonight, but there is definitely an agricultural base here and I don't have to tell you, there's also a technology sector here, so I'm sure we're going to hear about that. Up north, when we do these panels, it's all about big data. Uh, down here, I think we'll probably hear a little bit more about the uh, life sciences or biotech applications. So anyway, as I said, I'm Roger Rice, founder of the Rice Law Firm. We're a business, corporate, and tax firm. We have offices in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, and Southern California. Uh, we're about 25 lawyers now, and ag tech is a vertical for us. It's something we put a lot of energy into, a lot of time in. Uh, we even hire lawyers who are farmers, <laughs> 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 who you're going to meet tonight uh, to make sure we understand this space. I'd like to thank Moss Adams for being here on our panel tonight and helping us with this program. Moss Adams, I'll let me tell you more about Moss Adams, but it's a very large California accounting firm with a big presence in the agriculture community and a big presence here in San Diego. So what we'll do tonight is I have a few slides. I'm going to introduce the topic to you, to those of you who might be a little new to it, and give you our perspective on what ag tech is, what agri-tech is. Uh, we've got four companies that are going to do quick pitches, three-minute pitches, and we'll leave a couple of minutes for our panelists to ask them a few questions. So you can see up close and personal real live ag tech company. And then we're going to have a panel discussion. Uh, let's make this as interactive as we can uh, during our panel discussion. If you have things to say, make sure that you, that you ask. Uh, a couple of announcements. If you are tweeting tonight, and I hope that you are, <laughs> use hashtag AgTechSV. Okay, AgTechSV. Is that right? SV AgTech? Either one will get you there. <laughs> SV AgTech, AgTechSV. Um, and you should check out our websites, svagtech.org. That's our conference site, so you can see our, our events, and royceagtech.com, where you can see all of our programs. And uh, I guess one more commercial. We also started this thing over time. It started as a meetup, like most good ideas. Uh, it kind of went on to a series of white papers and programs and presentations. Uh, it grew from that into an incubator. So we started an ag tech incubator for startup companies. Last year, Palo Alto, we had 15 companies. That was a year ago. And since then, I've been kind of keeping track about half of them have been funded, okay? Which is off the charts for an accelerator incubator program. It's a very successful program. And it's just because just being in the right place at the right time and picking the right companies. And it has now launched, uh, morphed into an innovation network. And what we do uh, at least twice a month now is we bring in big egg food, big farmers, you know, uh, Western growers, for example, big organizations will come right into our office and sit down for a day or two and meet tech companies that are marketing their technology to the agricultural industry. Uh, we also do this with foreign countries where companies from other countries will come into California and sit down and have these meetings. So think of us as a, as a really sophisticated concierge service. We're all about making those connections and finding you, the tech companies, your strategic partners, your financiers, your acquirers, uh, or your customers. And that's what we're all about with the egg tech program that we've created. So make sure you check that out. That's, uh, that's at royceagtech.com. Now, with that, Vanna White, who's here, is going to help with the slides. 
All right, so I think everybody has probably heard this statistic. It's almost every one of these presentations start off with some statistics about how quickly the Earth's population is growing and just how much food production has to increase. And basically, uh, I think we all agree uh, that by 2050, we're gonna have to get a lot more efficient in the world if we're gonna feed the growing population. Because the thing about agriculture, uh, that's sort of interesting to think about it, is we're not making any more land. That's just the opposite. You know, land's being taken out of production. You know, where I come from the Midwest, we used to say that farmers are just land developers in disguise. And I think that's, that's very true. And in some parts of the country, the land has just been ruined, just environmentally devastated. It's never coming back. So production, so agriculture just has to become very efficient and get more outputs out of the same or fewer inputs. And that's what ag tech is really a lot about. Nine billion people, 100% more food. California is just so well poised for this. Um, I can't think of a better place for an ag tech movement to start than in California. Uh, and the reason is pretty obvious. Um, where I'm from in my neighborhood is, is about a quarter to a third of all the venture capital in the world, the starters. Uh, but it's also a $46 billion a year agricultural industry. $53 billion. It's grown since the last time I looked at this slide. <laughs> so it's a growing and uh, large agri uh, agricultural industry right here in California. And the thing about ag tech companies, it's a little different than a lot of other technology companies, is there's a huge advantage in being very close to your markets. So for example, if you've got a tech company that, that's around, doing something around soil health or E. coli or something like that, well, you can see the advantages of being located out in farm country. And we're seeing here in California, all over the state, uh, ag tech programs, incubators, accelerators, even co-works popping up out in the agricultural area. Salinas, Fresno, several in Davis, Sacramento, one up in wine country. So California, I think, is a natural place for this movement to really start and grow and it has been. So I, I, I think the first question that people all ask, at least in my world, uh, is, you know, can you get me funded? And the thing is, is while the venture, and we do a lot of venture capital in our firm, it's a big part of what we do. And while venture funding has taken a bit of a pause, I don't know if that's on your slide, this goes up to 2015, I will tell you in 2016, we've had a huge drop off in venture deals, but not in ag tech. Ag tech is still strong. It's really strong. In fact, it's probably the only sector that's been growing pretty much exponentially in terms of an investment sector. 4.6 billion last year, and it's on track to be about 2.5 billion this year, I think. Now, last year was a little bit of an anomaly uh, because of some big Chinese deals. But nevertheless, it's still a very big industry. There's a tremendous amount of investor interest in this. And you're going to find out why. Uh, okay. I can't see that one, so we've got to move on. <laughs> some, of the, some of the investment sources, um, uh, venture capital we talked about, uh, they're not up there, but all, all the big names, all the ones you might expect. Kleiner Perkins has been very active in this space, uh, Finisteer. Uh, but also, um, the crowdfunding site, Egg Funder. We've done a lot of deals with Egg Funder, and they've been very active and very successful about crowdfunding egg tech investments. Uh, Circle Up, Food Start. Uh, some of the accelerators that I mentioned have been doing really well. But really, uh, the big surprise here, I think, is corporate venture. Uh, Monsanto, Syngenta, I mean, even the big um, uh, Costco as a venture arm, for example. Uh, but corporate venture has really been supporting this area uh, quite a lot. Okay. So briefly, let me just run through uh, what we mean by ag tech. So number one, precision agriculture, okay? And that is just the idea of being very, very efficient, delivering just enough inputs <coughs> Just enough water, exactly where you need it, and not wasting any of it. We all know how important that sort of technology is here in California lately, right? That's precision agriculture, but not just water. Uh, it could be uh, fertilizer, it could be seeds. Did you know that you hit diminishing returns of seeds? If you plant, if you overplant, you lower your production. You know, there's a technology that figured that out. It tells you exactly how much to plant to maximize production. That's precision agriculture. Big data. Big data is really big. 
Um, it's <laughs> not so much about just gathering the information. It's taking the information and using it, turning it into something meaningful, uh, into statistics and information that farmers can make decisions uh, based on. So we do what we call anonymizing and aggregating, taking massive amounts of data and turning it into, in fact, so, words, so I tell people that last year was a year for big data because I saw a lot of companies, um, actually two years ago was the year for sensors in my mind. I saw a lot of companies with technologies that would gather the data. And then last year I saw a lot of companies taking that data and kind of putting it into something meaningful so you could see what it means. Like for example, the, the example about seeds I just gave, or fertilizer, or water, pretty much any input. This year is a year for predictive, we have a slide of predictive farming, this year we're using that data to predict and not only say, here's what the data says, so you can go figure it out, this is what you should do, Mr. Farmer. And if you do this, you'll get this result. It's, it's, it's deep learning, in fact. Deep learning and artificial intelligence. Okay, thanks. Um, IoT, Internet of Things, pretty much any technology that you can think of, you're gonna find, if you think about it, there's an agricultural application. We haven't hit robots yet, but some of the, the best applications have been in robotics. Machines that go up and down the fields trimming lettuce. Down here in your neighborhood, there's now a, a, a robot that will pick strawberries. I mean, and it's been around for a couple years now. But can you imagine about the most delicate produce you could, you could think of? And there's a machine that can harvest this. It's incredible. You know, it's really bad. Social media, of course, there are applications. Uh, more and more farms are getting wired. And as they get wired, people can communicate and they can share information. There are marketplaces. It's not perfect yet. I think there's an opportunity there, by the way. But there are marketplaces developing uh, all up and down the distribution chain from production all the way to the market, as well as just the exchange of information on social media. And then food tech is a whole other dimension of this, uh, of egg tech. We view that as being part of what we're doing everything around food, uh, reducing waste, uh, reducing damage, reducing spoilage, uh, and uh, also uh, technologies around the ultimate end user distribution side of this. Uh, technologies around nutrition, technologies around uh, informing the consumer as to what they're getting and what they might want. Drones. I hope we hear about drones because this has become controversial. I went to a drone conference in Salem last year. They filled up the Salem conventions in Oregon, filled up the convention center with drone companies. I, I couldn't believe how many there are out there. And that's just the drone companies. Then there's the, the companies that make the batteries and then the landing pads and the sensors in the drones and the companies that analyze the data. Um, and after all of that, there's a competing technology and that's satellites, micro satellites. I hope we hear a little bit about that today because people have, different views as to which one of those technologies is going to win. Robotics we've talked about, um, cellular egg and gene edited crops, we're going to hear about that on the panel. So let me just reserve on that for now. And I know that's probably a hot topic here in San Diego. Okay. What else you got? So um, concluding thoughts, we're going to have our, our pitches, but I just want to I'm hoping that you come away from this event tonight um, with a little bit of an understanding of where we think the market is, what this is, why we think it's a huge opportunity, um, and where we think the future is going with this, and what you might be able to do with that, no matter what you do. If you're a biotech uh, startup entrepreneur, you might think of this as an application. In fact, one of our companies last year was a guy who had developed a handheld pathogen detector that was in use in hospitals. And he said, you know, this is a great technology for agriculture because they have pathogens, you know, bacteria, and crops out in the field. And it's just this big hassle to try and figure that out. So that's a crossover technology. And we're seeing a lot of that, where you took that handheld hospital pathogen detector and applied it to agriculture so the farmer can walk through the field with his iPhone. And, you know, it's not an iPhone, but it looks like it and basically test the produce right in the field and get real-time results instead of having to take the product, send it to a lab, you know, wait a day or a week or whatever it takes and not do anything in the meantime. So you're gonna see lots of crossover here uh, 
uh, I think, and, and the more you hear about this, the more uh, ideas I think will come to you. Okay, so with that, as I said, we have a few pitches. Uh, we have four companies that are genuine ag tech companies. They are going to give you a little example of who they are and what they do. And, uh, and then our panelists will have two minutes to ask questions. So is Grow Guru here? All right. <coughs> Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Farooq, and I'm with this company called Grow Guru. Grow Guru is focused on cultivation of plants. And as Roger was pointing out a while back, our focus is to help the growers increase the yield, reduce the cost, and minimize the pollution. And how do we do it? We do it by providing sensors that measure various aspects of the soil. Sensors such as this. This is one example of a sensor. These are the probes that go inside the ground. You can put them on top of trellises in vineyards or landscaping companies which are our initial markets. Then these measure the moisture in the soil, the electrical conductivity in the soil, the salinity of the soil, and all this information is sent through another collector. This is what the grower has to connect. You see it's very easy to connect. You just need the power connection. Or we also have a solar one. And once that happens, we get the data on the cell phones. We provide the recommendations, the predictive analytics aspect of it that uh, Raja was referring to a while back in terms of the irrigation scheduling. You don't need to water for three days, stuff like that. So that's what Grow Guru does currently. And what's our differentiating factor? There are three differentiating factors for Grow Guru. The sensors that we have out here, currently they are being certified by CIT Fresno. We seem to be on track to be the first wireless soil sensor to be certified. That's one aspect of the uh, differentiating aspect. The second aspect of uh, what we have is the deployment itself. You, we don't need cellular connection, etc., to the sensors. You just need it from the collector back. So that's the second aspect of it, making it easier and quite affordable for the growers. And then the third aspect is the big data and the predictive analytics, which we are working on, especially as regards the health of the soil. Where are we in terms of uh, the company? Uh, we have started deploying our technology. We have been deploying this for about a year. But we did a pivot initially, the focus was on the residential, but the last six months we have been focusing on two main markets, the markets of vineyards and the markets of landscaping companies. And currently, we are also looking for investment to go to the next level. So definitely, if any of you have your own vineyards, I'd be interested in talking to you. If any of you have your own landscaping companies, I'd be interested in talking to you to figure out. And of course, if you are investors, we are looking for seed funding at this time. So three types of people, vineyard owners, landscaping company owners, or uh, investors, especially in, uh, for the seed funding round. How many more minutes? You another minute. So, and in terms of uh, uh, the business model, we are, again our focus is the solution that we have has both a hardware and a software component. As you can imagine from here, the hardware itself is about one tenth the cost of the cheapest, or, or at least the other solutions that you there that you see out there. There are big companies like Auto. Uh, Jane and all these other companies that are there and our sensors are about one tenth the cost just from a hardware perspective. So we make it very easy for the growers to deploy our solution. Let me give an example of a grower in Vinaya, Fresno, who deployed our solution. He was looking to deploy a solution and we gave him for his 40 acre vineyard a solution that cost him about $2,000 to deploy initially and it was in multiple locations and his point was, Farooq, you are making it very easy for me because if I run my truck over your sensor, well, big deal, I might have lost about a couple of hundred bucks. If I do the same thing with your competitor, I lose thousand, thousands of dollars and I can't sleep at night. So that's one of the things, but definitely uh, highly accurate, very affordable and very reliable data. That's what we are shooting for and focused on below the ground as opposed to drones, etc., which are above the ground. Okay, thank you. Okay, any questions here from our panel? I got one. So you're one of those guys I've been talking about. You're a technology guy selling to farmers. So what's that like? <laughs> I mean, I have been a technology guy. I have not been a farmer. One of the people on our team has been uh, working in the ag tech space, but it's been a learning experience, frankly. I mean. Uh, I learned about uh, the way you have to stress the, vine the, the vineyards at the right time in order to get the, the right quality of the grapes and all that stuff. I have no idea about it. I talk to the landscaping companies. I am a wireless guy. I am a big data guy. I am a data science guy. But when I talk to the landscaping companies, they have their own. So it's a big learning experience definitely for me personally. And uh, how do you take my strengths uh, and try to apply it 
so as to make life easier for the markets we are going on. Again, we are focusing just on vineyards and landscaping companies for now, but uh, we are also we started talking to Driscoll's in the strawberry space and other people who are interested, definitely, but we don't have enough cycles, that's why we are not going after the food. Okay. Panelists, have any questions? Seems to help. Um, <laughs> what is it that you sell? So you have hardware, you have data analytics that provides it. So are you selling a service? If I'm your customer, what, what is it that I'm buying? So you get the complete solution. The complete solution consists of these sensors that you put in your vineyard or your landscaping company or whatever form you have. And these sensors, they go inside the ground, the thing that you see out here. They measure electrical conductivity, they measure the soil yeah. moisture, stuff like that. And you also get this portion because these guys can't talk directly to the cloud, to your cell phone, stuff like that. So these guys talk to this other portion of it. And from here, using Wi-Fi or cellular, Bluetooth or cellular, we send the data to the cloud. And from there, we pull it on your Android phone, iOS phone, stuff like that. So we're selling the complete solution. All that you as the grower has to do is buy this, this and this hardware, put it in the ground, and then fire up your cell phone and start getting data on your cell phone. So how does the service keep working? So I get the information pushed to me from the sensor up to the cloud. Is there some type of intelligence that goes around the data or, or, or do I just get raw data? And I'm supposed to know what no, you do not get raw data. We process all the data. And in fact, one of the things that we have is something called the irrigation scheduling <coughs> service for the vineyard owners. So we take the raw data, we process the raw data. We also look at the evapotranspiration, which is the uh, how hot it's going to be and all that stuff. So we know how much water, how many inches of water do you have in the ground, and we know how many inches of water you need for the next week. So we tell you when to irrigate next. So do I pay you a subscription fee for the, for the, so about the data? Exactly. About the model, there are two aspects of the model. One is the low-cost hardware, but then the monthly subscription fees for the services that you subscribe for. The irrigation service, it's for 495, that's the current model that we have, 495 per month per sensor. Or uh, we have a couple of other services also, like uh, disease risk, telling you the, the risk of different diseases that you might have based on what we measure, we measure air temperature, humidity, stuff like that. So there are different uh, services, and you pay for, on a monthly basis, you pay for the services that you subscribe. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Jerry, Everybody Technologies. All right. I'll the slides. I have to say it's a real pleasure to give this talk at home. It took me about 15 minutes to drive here instead of going to Salinas to the Thrive Accelerator or St. Louis to the Yield Lab, where we are portfolio members of. So giving a talk in my own backyard about my passion is really great. Um, Roy said a, uh, uh, Mr. Royce did a great job on introducing the critical nature of the problem. Uh, the next slide uh, basically shows that the, um, the issue really is um, with this, this uh, conjunction of four major trends. I have a bird as an audience member. <laughs> uh, the four major trends, of course, are increased population, reduced land, increased demand for food, and uh, degrading soils, um, as well as the growth of the middle class. And so one, not the only solution, but we believe a very important solution is using genetics to improve the crops themselves through the seed. And this is, a, this is a field that I've been involved with for over 25 years. Yield is the most important thing. Um, so if you can get more output with the same inputs, you've got a huge advantage. And I believe this is one of the key solutions. It's ag biotech, not ag tech. Um, the next, the next uh, slide shows, in addition to conventional yields uh, basically plateauing, uh, there are also tremendous losses in, in the field and after harvest caused by senescence, by diseases, and by all kinds of abiotic stresses. And so the solution that we're offering to seed companies and indirectly then to farmers and consumers is on the next slide. And that basically involves licensing or co-developing seeds that have been gen either genetically modified or genome edited to have much higher yields in forage, row, and specialty crops. In addition to 20% or more increased yields, we can also get dramatically increased tolerance to these abiotic stresses. How is that done? It's through manipulation of a fundamental switch. The next slide, please. And the way it works is there are these two genes, and I won't go into the details, there's no time, but the cell is always sensing, every cell in every plant, every cell in every animal, 
is basically sensing the ratio of this unmodified protein to the decorated form of that protein. So this is conserved in all plants and all animals. The idea is that when there's more of the unmodified form of this protein, the cell continues to grow and divide. On the other hand, when it's decorated, if there's too much of it decorated, then it goes into apoptosis, the cell commits suicide, and it dies. So you can think of plants as always being subjected to sublethal stresses. When there's not enough food, not enough water, not enough nutrients, cells are always churning, they're turning over, and you're losing yield because of the programmed cell death. So if we can switch in favor of decreased uh, modified form or increased unmodified form, the next, um, you can decrease this by knocking down expression or knocking down, next, next slide. Um, if you shrink this or you increase this again, what happens is you get um, a shift, one more, and so you get these fat, you can't really see it here, but these are fat, happy Arabidopsis plants that have increased biomass, increased seed yield, and enhanced tolerance to stress and disease. And what I want to emphasize is this doesn't have to be done by what you would call GMO or transgenic methods. It can be done by genome editing methods, which are currently not regulated. By knocking down expression of this gene or deleting the active site of that gene in a very targeted way, there's no need for labeling, there's no need for uh, the deregulation that's required by the <coughs> Next slide. So basically the value proposition is by manipulating the switch in the, in the methods that I mentioned, you can get better shelf life, enhanced tolerance to diseases, and most importantly, improve the yield. I don't have time to go into all the data that was shown in the laboratory and the greenhouse. That sort of corresponds to phase one or phase two in drug development. I'm gonna I want to jump right to phase three, which are field trials. I believe that these kinds of technologies are only relevant and you should only pay attention to them if you can show conclusive proof in field trials. Because there are lots and lots of leads, as there are in curing cancer in mice and so It's easy to cure cancer in a mouse, it's hard for people. So, so it goes with crops. It's easy to find yield genes in the lab. In the lab, sometimes they translate to the greenhouse, almost never to the field. So the next slide shows um, in alfalfa, which is the third largest, please, uh, the third largest crop in the United States. Oh, just skip through this. This is tomatoes, bananas, disease tolerance, next, in, in canola. So this is really what I want to focus on, is the alfalfa part. So there were two year, years of replicated field trials with alfalfa, where one of these genes was increased in expression. The next slide shows the data. I was very, um, so basically it's an $8 billion market. About $1 billion is exported, mostly to the Far East and the, and the Middle East. Um, for 20 years, uh, people have been trying to improve the yield of alfalfa completely unsuccessfully. So there's really been no yield increase in alfalfa. But by increasing the level of that unmodified gene, um, we found that there were in field trials, replicated field trials, between 20 and 45% increased yield. That's really pretty, pretty remarkable. I spoke to the heads of the uh, National Hay Association that sort of run this $8 billion industry, and they said if, if, this, if these results are correct, it would revolutionize their industry. Um, and the most important thing is that quality is maintained. Next slide. And so this slide is completely unreadable. I was very proud of it. And someone told me, Jerry, this is the worst slide I have ever seen. <laughs> so next, I trimmed it down. I picked the top three from this year's field trial, the top three from that next. And now you can kind of see what I'm trying to show, which is the yields are 36, 136%, 20%, et cetera, 133% the second year. The quality, we'll just call it by colors. These are, these are traditional alfalfa quality measurements. Bottom line is we're getting 33%, 36% increase in yield with no decrease in quality. This is covered by 16 US patent applications, a new application in process, and these are the phenotypes that result. And so about the bottom line to the IP is that uh, anybody that changes the expression of these two genes um, or changes the, um, the, uh, the activity of the genes will infringe our patents. And I'm almost done. I want to tell you about the team. Yeah. Uh, we have a very experienced team. If I added up all the experience of the members of the direct management team and the consultants, it's something like 225 years. It's a bunch of old white guys that really know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Next. And so this has been licensed now to a few couple of companies you might have heard of. Monsanto for corn and soy, Scott for turf, and an Israeli company for bananas. And finally, in summary, next slide, please. 
again. So our customers are seed companies um, that already have transgenic varieties or are interested in improving their elite varieties. The, seed, the, uh, the management team is very experienced. We have proof of efficacy in the lab, greenhouse, and field trials. Um, very broad and deep IP. We have joint venture terms agreed with the third largest alfalfa seed company. And as I mentioned, genome editing avoid <coughs> GMO issues. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. or TV or overhead or any way for me to share slides, so I didn't bring them. But here I am, nonetheless. So my name is Paul Bola. I am the CEO of Symbiotic Systems. We are also a San Diego company. Um, we're out of Sorrento Valley. We were formed in 2011. We started filing IP in 2012. Um, since then, we've gone from um, our initial focus, which was uh, grow lighting that would replace the existing technology in the grow light indoor market. Um, to a more broader space, and I want to tell you guys a little bit about that. And it'd be easy with slides, but I'll try to paint pictures with my words. So um, the first thing is, is what we do is we create intelligent light for plants. Now what does that mean? What it means is, when you look at the spectrum of light that comes out of, say, the sun, you're looking at a bunch of different colors, and each one of those is like a crayon. Each one of those crayons has a result within a plant, and the expression that the previous speaker was just talking about are stimulated by these specific um, photons of light that come out of, uh, colors of light that come out. And so what is that? What does it mean? Um, well, what we, we kind of latched onto is it's epigenetics. Epigenetics is a way to change the expression of plants without genetically modifying them or using CRISPR-like solutions. And to the example of what we do, um, maybe I could just reference a couple of trials that we've done. We've been doing trials, both uh, third party and in-house, to show what the differences are. So um, initially we did uh, some trials with, um, with basil, simple basil. So against the existing highest uh, value technology that there is in the grow light space, we grew 184% more mass using the same amount of energy. So that's one. Um, two. Um, when we started talking about our technology, of course we got bombarded by the cannabis groups. So indoor uh, agriculture uh, is synonymous with cannabis. So they come to us, right? So we said, all right, try our technology, try our IP, try one of our lights. Um, they got back to us, we took a look at the product, um, we sent it to the lab to be analyzed. Well, we had 41% higher THC and over 200% higher uh, uh, cannabinoids. And but these are the medicines that are inside of cannabis. So while this doesn't apply specifically to cannabis, which is about 4% of our market, it does apply to biotech very solidly. And so some of the investors that we have uh, initially on our friends and family round come from the biotech space. The CTO of uh, Chief Science Officer of Illumina Biotech, some of the uh, higher ups in Celgene, taking a look at what we're doing and what that can mean for their industry. Um, now, biotech is a middle tier for our, our um, market. We're looking at uh, phytoceuticals, which are drugs derived from plants, including cannabis. We're looking at uh, biotech, which is uh, drugs, and, and of course, you know how to, how to create those. Um, our top tier is, is agriculture. For many of the reasons that uh, Roger brought up and some of these other speakers have brought up, agriculture is very important. We have a limited amount of resources, and um, we have finite uh, applications unless we innovate better. And for that, what we've done is we've started taking a look at what this means to increase through epigenetics the density of chemistry within the plant, nutrient-wise. We are all a bunch of stomachs chasing nutrients. It doesn't matter how much mass you eat, you're looking for nutrients. What if we can intensify through epigenetics the density of nutrition within the plant? And that's what we're starting to focus on. This is not a very known uh, area, and I'm gonna watch my time here so I don't get off uh, too off track, but I'll, I'll say a couple um, of words here. Photochemistry, photochemistry, photon and chemistry. So what we have here is we have, uh, say you're, you're looking at a library, like a big library like say Cornell, right? You have 50,000 books on agriculture that took 15,000 years to collect all this data. And then you have chemistry, which took about 10,000 years to collect all this data, and we have it all in 50,000 books in a library. Now we get to the point on photochemistry, and we have about 10 books, and they say you use blue in the spring, 
red in the fall, change your photo period, and you're going to get these results with your plants. All of the rest of the books need to be written. And so what we've done is we've built a computer that is also a functional tool that allows us to collect this data. It is big data. It is also a proprietary application of the technology, which is individual photons and the results that they produce in plants. So um, without getting too much off track and for sake of uh, um, shortness here, I'll kind of leave it with a, a couple of, of just really simple um, facts about our company. We've gone through our friends and family round. We're currently in field trials with some large agricultural producers in the Central Valley, as well as some commercial producers uh, on the West Coast. Um, we're looking to uh, get into the market uh, beginning of next year. We've been testing against a company called Gavitas, and Gavitas was just acquired by Scott's 75% ownership for $136 million last week. <clears throat> when we grow against the Gavitas light, we create 184% more mass per watt than they do, and they were just acquired by Scott's. So, um, just a little intro into what we do. If you have any questions, um, we're looking for people who like precision agriculture, people who are interested in upping the chemistry within their plants, uh, people who are interested in exploring with sensors what the new applications are. Thank you. Sure. No problem. All right. You'll stick around. I think all of our presenters will stick around for questions later if anybody would like to talk with them. So, if you want a little light reading, how the author of this book is going to come up next. Go ahead and talk about moon energy. Thanks a lot. Um, just a quick background on myself. Uh, I'm an ecologist by training and a farmer by vocation for almost 20 years. And uh, I guess one of my most noted uh, conversations with uh, early on with the USDA was, hey, I'm out here getting nine pounds a square foot with vegetables, and you guys say we can't get more than a pound. And they said, that's not possible. We won't come out and see your farm. <laughs> so um, <coughs> there's a lot of entrenched ideas in agriculture. And more lately, I've been actually an integral part of ARS, the Agricultural Research Service, because a few rather intelligent people at the top figured out, oh, he may have some good suggestions for us. So we see a lot of research going on now that starts to look like some of our entrepreneurs here are pursuing, which I am so glad to see the change in paradigm. And what I've been doing is describing paradigm for about 35 years, especially in regards to how farmers need to get further up the value added chain if they're going to be able to keep their farms. Now, you may hear some heretical things from me here because some things I don't support and I'm not going to get into a debate here, but what I'm saying is everything we need to help farmers um, become stable, produce more food, produce more bio-refined products, and also greater yield for the rest of the world. So, and also just change the way we do a few things, which seem obvious, but we haven't done before. So, one of the things farmers used to do in America and around the world is make alcohol. In fact, if you ever read Gene Lodgston's book uh, about farming, uh, it's one of his ones about farming is that, you know, the corn, you know, it was okay to pay the note, you know, or pay your annual expenses, but if you wanted to pay the farm off, you had to turn the corn into whiskey and sell that on the side. And of course, nowadays, farmers who have a big cornfield, you know, sometimes pay the note off because they have a little patch of marijuana out in the middle of the cornfield. And, you know, this pattern of looking for a higher value product to be able to pay off the capital expenses of the farm. Now, you know, we're looking at something that has more uses. So when we say alcohol, we are talking about moonshine. We are talking about 200 proof moonshine. We are talking about moonshine good enough, if you want it refined that way, to be used in the making of drugs. And how were drugs made? Drugs are made by taking a farm product or a wild product, chopping it up, soaking it in alcohol, so all the active ingredients go into the alcohol, and then strain it out and evaporate the alcohol. The little bit of powder that's left in the bottom is the raw drug for which they charge us an arm and a leg and our child's, you know, revenue for the next 10 years. So those guys don't care about what happens to the alcohol. Oh, it evaporated, whoopee. 
But we're charging these guys forty, fifty, a hundred dollars a gallon for this pharmaceutical grade alcohol, which has no trace byproducts that might react with the chemicals. And all around the world, there are pharmaceutical companies needing this grade of alcohol. So we're not those guys who say, let's make more alcohol to put in cars, although we do that too. But that's the lowest grade of alcohol. There's beverage grade, there is perfume grade, and all of these make a farmer or a entrepreneur's company more money. Now, where do we make the alcohol from to make the most money? Well, it's not by growing a crop, at least not initially. What we get to make alcohol from are waste products. All that fast food and other food you get to eat out there went through a process to get where it is, and most of it was thrown away. And that throwing away ends up in a landfill and makes methane, and no one really much likes that. And so that waste product, is what we go after first in making alcohol. There's over 20,000 locations in the United States alone that could use one of our one to 10 million gallon per year plants to take their waste, process it, and pay for the whole plant and just drive <coughs> their, their waste costs. But the profit for making alcohol from these wastes makes it totally worthwhile, and in some cases, there are actually a few incentives left for us to make money I'm producing alcohol. We can produce alcohol for about 50 or 60 cents a gallon from waste products. 50 or 60 cents a gallon. For using waste products to make alcohol, there's a dollar one tax credit for every gallon you produce. So if it costs you 60 cents, but they pay you a dollar one, well, that's a pretty good business. But those tax credits can disappear at any time. The renewable fuel standard, which makes the oil companies add, um, environment cleaning fuel that is not made from non-renewable sources like oil uh, will we'll pony up 45 to a dollar a gallon because like a carbon credit, they have to buy those renewable fuel credits. But those might go away too. By itself, alcohol is profitable enough, um, and we have some of these packs we can leave for you, where on an average mix of, of alcohol from a plant, it pays back in 16 months. Now, that's without any of the very great byproducts, which can be added. For every gallon of alcohol we produce, we can raise fish on the solids that are left over after extracting the carbohydrates, the starches or sugars, out of the original material. We get $30 worth of fish for every gallon of alcohol we produce. That's by feeding the byproduct to the fish. Now, we can, and we do at our place in, uh, um, Santa Cruz is we first process those solids into methane where we, this is ag tech, right? So we go ahead and make methane, which runs our boiler. Oh, that just dropped our cost another 11 cents. And the anaerobically digested byproducts from the plant are now fully soluble. We put those into a cattail marsh. Cattails, you know, the plants that look like a stick with a hot dog on top. Well, those <laughs> actually produce enough material to make alcohol to the tune of 7,500 gallons an acre compared to corn at 300 gallons an acre. And, you know, we, oh, we're getting to the end. Okay, so the Roman army, part of your salary was a flask of cattail whiskey. And in Russia, they still drink cattail whiskey. And, but, uh, in Russia, they'll drink anything. So I'm gonna sell it here. <laughs> now, let's get to the nuts and bolts. We're a company that has been around uh, for seven years now in our uh, primary uh, A round and now our B round. Uh, the A round went very well. The B round is close to being finished. We only have a, a few million dollars worth left there. Uh, in the process, we have 15 uh, technologies we want to patent as part of the funding of the B round. We also have quite a few other patents that, uh, one of course, um, in using the byproduct from alcohol for uh, weed, um, weed abatement and fertilization would reduce the two biggest costs in corn farming, for instance, by, uh, by basically all of it into byproduct. So we're looking at giant numbers, not two or three percent. When you work in biology, the effects are huge. When you work in chemistry, it's incremental. So, with our company, we solve problems around the world, taking ag waste and, and making it into valuable products. 
And we do that at a scale that's affordable and not gigantic. We're looking at one to 10 million gallons a year. So those of you who are interested in seeing this vast sea of agricultural waste become something valuable, come talk to us. We have a very profitable way to go about that. Okay, thank you very much. For all our presenters, so you saw a, very, a wide range of different technologies that are focused on the agricultural markets. So with that, we're going to go into our, our panel now. I'd like to remind people that if you're tweeting and if you're tweeting photos, um, hashtag SVAgTech. And before you leave, in the back, we have some promotional materials. I you know, uh, encourage you to grab one. You might take a look at our last Silicon Valley AgTech conference to get an idea of the speakers, the program, and the things that we talk about. We do this once a year up in Silicon Valley. Uh, we're going to be in Chicago this fall with this conference as well, and in other parts of the country next year. So let me introduce our panel, first of all. Uh, on uh, my immediate right is Erica Riel Carton. She is a lawyer with our firm, uh, the Royce Law Firm. She's a business lawyer with a very uh, special emphasis on agriculture and ag tech. She was a grower before she became a lawyer. <clears throat> so uh, we'll see how well that decision works out for you. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, so she has a very unique perspective on this and a lot of background uh, in, in agriculture <coughs> and really a lot on the technology side. Eric Ellistad, Ellistad is from Local Roots Farms in Los Angeles, also grassroots capital. Uh, he has uh, been a frequent uh, uh, panelists for us, uh, extremely knowledgeable about the ag tech and agricultural markets. He's an investor, he's an entrepreneur, knows this area as well as anybody. So thank you for coming down here today, Eric. Larry Kammerer is a partner at Moss Adams. Uh, he specializes in early stage startups. He comes from the Bay Area, so he's come down to help us, one of our host companies, Moss Adams. Thank you, Larry. And Brian Powell is a tax partner at Moss Adams. Uh, up in uh, Washington, central Washington. He spends 100% of his time on agribusiness. So he knows the agricultural side of this in Washington and Oregon primarily. So thank you, Brian. So before we get going, and I, I thought what we do is maybe spend about 40 minutes of <coughs> panel discussion, and then I'm gonna open it up for questions. So if you have questions, save them up, or let me know as we go along, because we wanna make this as interactive as possible. But before we do that, I'd like to give the panelists an opportunity to maybe say a little bit more about who you are and how you come to the area and what, you know, what message do you have in part that people really need to take away from this today. So Erica, why don't we start with you? So, like Roger mentioned, uh, I grew up in the Midwest. I was a grower. My technical background is in agriculture. Um, and I transitioned into law because I wanted, as a grower, you know, I can only walk the field so many times, look at irrigation so many times, and see your plants die so many times. Um, but no, what I, what I really like about agriculture is that I, I know myself personally, I'm a provider, I like to provide. And um, something I was really drawn to with technology is that I understand, and a lot of people who are very enthusiastic about technology understand, is technology is going to radically change the world in the next you know, couple decades, it already has this decade, and technology is really going to improve the basic standards of living. And I was really excited when I saw that happening in agriculture. Um, and so that's really how I got started in the tech and the law end. And I think uh, something I hope you take from tonight is um, just to get involved in however you can. If you're not already involved, there's a lot to do. Ag is a very big field. Um, so, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. Okay, thank you. Eric? Well, thanks for having me. It's uh, phenomenal to see everyone here. Um, a little bit about my background and how I ended up at Local Roots. Um, originally, um, got introduced through my family's business, which has been in the perishable distribution industry for the last four generations, 100 years, working with farmers, getting the product from the farm to the terminal market. Uh, still in that business today. So I grew up looking at the challenges and complexities of the supply chain, logistics behind the food system, uh, and seeing a lot of the costs and spoilage rates there. Um, then spent some time in venture finance looking to invest in early stage companies around food, water, energy, and logistics, and where those industries really collided and intersected. Um, and realized that was a really terrible way to scratch my entrepreneurial itch 
and ended up launching Local Roots, which is an indoor vertical farming company. We uh, were very vertically integrated. We design, build, operate, and grow and sell fresh local produce out of our uh, controlled environment farms. So we have our hands in a lot of the technologies that we've heard about tonight, from uh, sensors and control systems and data analysis and big data machine vision to really manage the growing environment crops to deliver a fresher, healthier, more nutritious product with higher yields and lower costs anywhere in the world. So we really look at tackling food system uh, problems and, and supply chain issues for large buyers and local communities alike, um, not just here in Southern California, but around the world. So our, our mission is to improve global health by, by building a better food system. And as far as takeaways from tonight, um, there's uh, a million problems to solve in the food system. It's going to take all of us and everyone not in this room working together and collaborating. And I think it's important that we realize that we're not on an island by ourselves and there's partnership and knowledge to be shared. And um, a lot of people come before us. So let's, let's find ways to, to collaborate and work on really tackling that big, uh, hairy, audacious goal of feeding uh, 9 billion people on the planet in the next 30 years. Right. I'm Larry Cameron from Moss Adams. We're a large accounting firm all throughout the western United States. And uh, I grew up in the Central Valley in California working my way from college uh, in agriculture. And the goal was to get out of agriculture as soon as I could. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's funny how it's kind of come full circle. I eventually made my way uh, to the Bay Area, where naturally uh, started working with a lot of technology companies, because that's what we do there. And uh, found my passion in working with entrepreneurs uh, really smart people at what they do, um, but not always the best business people or didn't know how to raise funds or, or how to grow a business or how to operate it on a shoestring when that's what it needs to, what needs to happen. And, and uh, my experience in helping companies grow that is my contribution to my clients and the people that I counsel. Uh, and, and it's how I can make better for the world by leveraging through others uh, instead of going out and starting my own company by working with you know, hundreds of entrepreneurs, uh, I can help them to, to reach their dreams and impact the world uh, better. So I've got the best job in the world. It's ironic that I'm at a, at a large company. Moss Adams is a very large company. We handle companies from startup to uh, very large you know, uh, companies that are acquired or go for public companies. Uh, I work at the very beginning of that cycle, which is a unique spot at Moss Adams. I work with the kinds of early stage companies that I think represent, you know, that, that a lot of you here uh, represent. And Brian uh, might be more on, on, the, on the other end of that. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Uh, exciting stuff to hear about. I'm from Washington State, and uh, actually Central Washington State. And my passion is to, is 100% agribusiness, the vertical of food. And <clears throat> it's interesting to talk about this. And, where you guys have started and where you're going with all this information. In 1999, we wanted to be different than any of other accounting firm out there. We, so we started our food and egg business practice within Los Adams. And now we're the fastest growing group in Los Adams, and we're the fourth biggest group in Los Adams with over 10% of the revenues of Los Adams in food and egg. So it's <clears throat> fabulous. And one of the interesting stats that Roger, you might put on top of this is that <clears throat> about 10 years ago when people were bidding on production ag land, there was generally less than 100 people bidding on that land. Now there's over 250 people, mostly private equity, that are trying to get their hands into agriculture. And so <clears throat> my name, what my job is to represent agribusiness and food on the West Coast, for the entire firm and also drive um, benefits to all the owners so because of taxation so you would take advantage of everything that's in the code related to farming and production farming. It's the most favored section in the code. So lots of good stuff. Okay, thanks very much panelists. So let me ask the audience here um, uh, I know we have some growers here today. How many How many growers, how many farmers are with us today? So, okay, this is more, more than usual. Uh, how many startup company entrepreneurs? Okay, so, so, um, 
So let me kind of just go right to the big question then, and I think we're going to start with you, Eric. I mean, where is the big opportunity in ag tech today? I mean, what is, what is hot? Uh, what is something that people might want to think about putting their energy into if they're a startup entrepreneur looking for the next big thing? Um, where to start? <laughs> So I think I think biotech side, especially being here in San Diego, is, is very important. Can y'all hear in the background? Is this on? Uh, oh, okay. Good. How about now? Is it better? No. Nope. Nope. How about now? Good. Yes. All right. Um, so I think I think the biotech side of the ag, which um, especially being here in San Diego, is is, is very important to look at. Um, how do we get you know increased yields and increase the global food production, given the productivity increases about the farm, which has been historically right around two percent. Um, how do we escalate that? How do we increase that and get a, a hockey stick type inflection point in protein and fruit and vegetable production uh, globally? Um, that, that, that is not our business, so I can't speak too much to exactly the developments there that I think will be transformational. But I think that's one side of ag that's going to be uh, one of the next big things. Uh, the other thing that we are squarely positioned in, which is how do you re-envision where, where and how production can happen? And so rather than trying to um, increase yields and, and minimize inputs to our existing resource being land, which is constrained to certain geographies and climates that are appropriate uh, for certain crops. How do we begin to create farmland and create production in, in new areas where consumption is actually happening? And for us, we see that as, as cities, urban environments where the cost of land is higher, um, higher density applications, parts of the world that are um, climactically or geographically inappropriate for conventional animal farming. When you start to bring agriculture indoors, you begin to insulate production from not environmental <coughs> risks, but remove the need for the crops to be dependent on the animal environment. <coughs> By doing that and taking control over all the factors that drive plant growth, you can really begin to optimize and get those higher yields, reduce a lot of those inputs, and truly optimize. And then begin to re-envision the whole distribution chain. Uh, today, farming is very good at growing a large volume of food for very cheaply and delivering that product all over the world. Uh, but what is the quality of that product? What is the nutritious content of that product? And what is the burden on the environment of the production side of that equation? Um, I think technologies that we can do break down all three of those issues um, are gonna generate massive, massive returns. Um, I'll pause there and see if anyone says that. That's interesting. I might add one thing to that, is that one of the things to consider when you're talking biotech on the is, and there's been a lot of companies that have tried this with an agribusiness, is that <clears throat> timing is everything. Anytime you increase production or increase size in a high margin or a high production period, where you're already having incremental sales value on farm day price at higher input cost, is devastating. So making sure you're maintaining margins at farm gate is absolutely critical. Once you oversupply, and we're quite good at oversupplying that, and it kills margins and will put you out of business quickly. Okay, go ahead. Make sure you hold the mic close to your mouth so people can hear in the back. Go ahead, Erica. The one thing I want to add is just if, if you're not already in the space, you're a startup looking to apply your technologies to ag, because there's different ways to go about it. And um, one of them is what crop are you going to choose? A lot of people like the high value crops. Some are really targeting commodity crops, so really, really think about that in terms of market. Obviously, you know, geographic differences too, I'm sure you've thought about that. But market entry into the supply chain, which is something Eric kind of briefly touched on, a lot of people we that we see are gonna go, they're, they're direct to grower, DTG. And for their technology, you know, I kind of warn them, that may not be the way you should go with your technology. Maybe there are other entry points. Maybe you should be looking a little bit farther down the supply chain to the to the distributors and the processors. You know, so I I would caution you to not try and narrow too far if you're just getting in because there's so much out there and there's so many different ways to apply technology. Okay, thanks very much. You know, one of the comments that one of the uh, panelists here was talking about um, selling to the farming community and uh, what a big risk it is uh, for a lot of growers to try a new technology. It's a big expense, but if it doesn't work, it's a big risk as well. And I guess we've got some people on the panel that have some background in agriculture as well as tech. And I guess uh, what I'd like to maybe focus on here for just one question at least is 
what is that market and that industry, the customers for ag tech, the farmers and the growers, what is that like and how is that different from you know, other industries, from selling technology or selling to hospitals or to selling to parties like that? Does anybody want to take that? So Larry, I know you said you were a farmer, so. Uh, Eric, I, I know Eric was, so. You want to start that off? Are you asking me how to market to growers? What's different about it? What should people know if you're gonna if you're gonna get into this and if you're gonna take your technology and, and, and apply it to this new vertical, you know, what's the big surprise that we all we all realize? I think the big surprise is that growers are very sophisticated. They're businessmen. They have businesses for decades, and so a lot of people, a lot of startups or co-founders, we tell them to get out in the field, and they do. And I'm very proud of them. But they get into the field and they approach the farm and they say. I'm gonna, I'm gonna solve your, you know, I'm gonna increase yield by 30% and I'm gonna do it in one season. Just give me a chance. And everybody in, under, in ag understands that those types of um, output increases is incremental and if it's not incremental, you are somehow negatively affecting something else. And so if you kind of, if you just start from that perspective of knowing that the growers are highly sophisticated, they're in a, you know, they're, they're, they're in one of the oldest industries. I always, when, when people in the car industry, they come at me and they say, oh, we're the oldest industry. I say, no, no, <laughs> ag is the oldest industry. We grew crops, we domesticated crops, we mass produced crops, you know. So I think really understanding and being humble about going, and then, you know, make sure you have car hearts and make sure you have all of those, those other you know, things that, that farmers, so they know that you really are about the, the industry and you're not just looking to make a quick buck off them because they're, they they can tell as soon as you approach them, even if you have a truck, even if you're, you know, <laughs> even, if you, even if you have, you look kind of like you're in the ballpark, but they'll know right off the bat that you're not everything that you think you are. So. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, I think it's actually very similar to other businesses in a lot of ways. It's it's ROI, right? Are you increasing yields, reducing costs? It's a challenging business, and they're sophisticated. They've been doing it probably for generations, and they've been working on these problems for a long time. And so, especially for uh, a technologist, technology company, um, understanding that they've probably looked at this problem in a million different ways. And you might have a new tool, you might have a, a, a way to expand their solution set, but assuming that they haven't looked at and evaluated every solution on the market, performed complex analysis around that, is, is probably false. So, I, I think I think they're very sophisticated and. It's got to improve economics at, at the end of the day. I only have one more thing to it. I think you guys hit it on the head, is that it really relates to also their sophistication, but understanding the impact on their sales price. Is that, and that's where almost everybody, you know, impact, hey, if you have more yield, you'll get more sales price. That's not true. And so knowing the complications of sales price in dealing with commodities and specialty crops is critical. <coughs> And they live and breathe that. And so understanding what they their pain points on sales prices is, is impactful. So Larry, I know you do a lot of work with startups and startup entrepreneurs. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how a typical startup, being an ag tech startup or any other kind of company, might, might most effectively organize itself and, and uh, what sort of structure it should be. And, uh, uh, what its path might look like as it goes to get financing. By the way, we have one extra mic down there. Yeah, I mean, what we typically see is is a, a corporation uh, a form um, because it, it tends to be the most versatile. Most of the companies that I see, um, uh, there's not a lot of money to be spent until they raise money. Everyone's trying to do it on, on the cheap, and so, Although there may be some benefits of organizing as a flow-through type of entity, like an LLC or something, we don't often see that. Uh, we see the corporations more often, um, uh, unless unless the founder, had, you know, can make a substantial investment themselves to fund the company. Otherwise, if you're looking to raise funds quickly, you're probably going to need to become a corporation anyway, because outside investors are not likely to want to invest. Uh, uh, in, in your corporation, um, although we do see a lot of convertible debt, which could push off that conversion to, to, to equity, but 
we just see a lot of people keeping it simple, honestly, uh, forming these corporations uh, uh, and keeping it lean, uh, and keeping it lean until until they raise money, and then we see a, a really rather rapid ramp up uh, then. Probably the best entrepreneurs that I've met in the early stages are really good at keeping it lean. Are probably also the ones that keep it lean too long after they raise that round. They they still keep that lean mentality. I know that sounds right, but what did you raise? You know, uh, a, a round for you. You're going out to quickly ramp, and by by using that lean mentality, a lot of times what I've seen is people holding back the company from the growth that the investors uh, invested to get. Um, so it's, I sympathize because it's a rapid pivot point where you went from working, making something out of nothing to then rapidly growing the company. It's a completely different mindset and it seems to be a really hard, hard pivot for, for entrepreneurs to do. You know, you, you saw my slide on where the money is coming from in this area. A lot of crowdfunding, a lot of corporate venture capital, and the VCs are putting a tremendous amount into this space. Does that change? Does that inform the, the choice of entity for an ag tech startup for you, or change your answer in any way? Because sometimes people ask me all the time, should I be an LLC? Should I be in this corporation? What do you think? No, I don't think it does change it because uh, uh, if it was going to stay closely held, I would actually say yes, that would change it. But bringing in outside money, I I think means you're going to be a corporation, a C corp, a C corporation. Yeah, you're going to be a C corporation without getting into the technicalities of you're, you're practically not going to be anything else. Uh, so if you think that's in your path, uh, that you'll be raising outside money from beyond friends and family, uh, if you're not going to fund it yourself, I think you're going to be a C corporation very soon. And so it, it might make sense just to start there as opposed to going through a, a little bit of an awkward conversion that we sometimes see of LLCs that then convert to C corporations after they receive outside funding. Okay, thanks. So being that we're in San Diego, I want to kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about the life science technology aspect of this. And I heard the presentation, I heard somebody mention GMO, and I heard something about gene editing. Uh, Erica, can you maybe, just so we all are on the same plane, and so I understand what you're talking about, tell me what that is again. And then let's talk about what the opportunities are there, what the technologies are, in addition to the one that we saw earlier. Yeah, so I think more people, more people are very familiar with, with GMO and what it means to be transgenic, but just very, very generally, what, what, it, what the technology does is it can change, it can modify the crop and it do it. what people were worried about that weren't really, well, so the basics is that you are using uh, foreign DNA to transfer, transfer um, genes into a crop, and so transgenic genetic modification. Um, it, it has origins, I mean, 1980s, but even kind of dating back to that. And what's changed with gene editing and CRISPR-Cas9, that, that actually kind of started four or five years ago, and it's just really the applications, the awesome applications are coming out now. And what's different about gene editing is you no longer need to do the transgenic process. You no longer need foreign DNA in order to, um, like, like the presentation, in order to turn off a gene, turn off a trait, or remove a trait, or uh, or otherwise use the genomic data that we're, come, that, that we're still discovering every day. And from the from the regulatory side, it is. Uh, like the presenter said, it is not regulated in the same way that GMOs are regulated. It's still regulated as all conventional crops will be reg are regulated today. So I don't want people to think that, oh, it's completely unregulated and it's just running around like crazy. No, it's still regulated like conventional crops. Um, I don't know what, what, what would you use it for? I mean, I've heard about keeping apples from getting brown. Oh, yeah. Stuff so, like that. yeah. Since Larry's the first one I saw where I said, Wow, someone really paid for that. <laughs> so what else can we do with yeah, this? Yeah, so, um, so the two big ones that have actually, the, the USDA has come out and said, oh, we are not going to regulate this, reducing um, 
slowing down when mushrooms brown, slowing that process down so you can extend the shelf life of mushrooms. The other one I think is in, and you'll know better than me, but I think it's in corn. No, it's Arctic apples. Arctic apples, what is there corn? It's Okanagan specialty fruits. Uh, Oh yeah, herbicide resistant canola. That was one I was thinking. And yeah, Arctic potatoes. apples. Huh? The potatoes. Maybe yes, potatoes. the potatoes and the potatoes. So all around, you know, turning off the gene that, that DNA, DNA potatoes are are cisgenic. They're not genome edited. It means yeah. that they're simply tweaking a potato gene. They're not taking insect or virus or fish gene. They're just changing a potato gene in potatoes. That's cisgenic. It's not genome edited. Did everyone hear that? Cisgenic versus transgenic. <laughs> anyway, so what, what <laughs> there's a bunch of scientists in the field if you're really in the room, if you're really interested. But the, te what the results that are coming out is what we're starting to see is this technology is playing across different verticals. So on the food side, reducing, reducing, uh, reducing spoilage in the medical industry. We're hoping that, oh, you can help um, with pig and, pig and org pig and cow tra uh, transplants for heart, heart transplants, you will be able to remove the, the antibodies <coughs> from that so that someone who has a transplant won't be able or will not need medication for the rest of their life. That may be one application. Another application in the food is remove the allergens um, that cause peanut allergies but still have peanuts. Some people are playing around in that. So gene editing is, is I'm really excited about that. And GMO, that doesn't mean that GMO is going to go away. Um, like Eric said, these are all different types of tools that will still be around. <laughs> the, the only thing, is, especially with CRISPR Cas9, the rate of change is just accelerating. I mean, I think these tools have been available and accessible for a very long time, uh, but the penetration into industry and the applications are increasing exponentially. So not only with hardware costs coming down, efficiencies increasing, big data changing things, but you have the biological side, which is also accelerating. So I think there's opportunities for that across the board. So Brian, have you seen, and I know you do a lot, you told me about apples, I guess, that's what's big in Washington and Oregon. Have you seen a lot of uh, acceptance of new technologies uh, among your, your clients? Yeah, I think timing of uh, disruptive technology. Um, overall, the egg industry on almost all of the verticals is extremely profitable right now. And so there's a lot of money being thrown back into technology. And so I think it's good timing that they're looking for uh, modestly disruptive technology to test and then to the trial and take it all the way through all their crops. So timing for that is good. And they're, re they're receptive to buying right now. It cycles back down, they're not going to have the extra money to do it, but right now it's pretty good high time. Okay, thanks. You know, I listened to the gene editing, it reminds me of a friend of mine, he started a company, uh, and his idea was he, he was going to solve the problem of aging. So he, he got a bunch of rats, and he had to mess around with the genes, and he ended up with all these transgenic rats. And So I called him about a year after he started this, and I said, did you solve that problem of aging yet? Am I going to live forever? He says, no, but I'm making a lot of money selling transgenic rats. <laughs> so, but now we're using it for agriculture. But, but let's pivot a little bit from that. I want to talk about some specific technologies. Um, another, another poll of the audience. Is anybody here involved in animals at all? Animal science, livestock, anything like that? All right, two people. So uh, I don't see a lot of, of I, I see a few, you know, a few different animal science or livestock technologies, or mostly around, around ranch management. But I guess I would ask, have you seen anything out there, anything big, any, you know, any big trends we should know about, other than the ranch management software? Well, I got, I got one more I want to tell you about. Uh, we have one company in our incubator, uh, they have a device that you put on cattle that keeps them walking around, uh, because it keeps them healthier. Uh, so it's like a Fitbit for cows, I guess, is kind of how I think about it. But other than that, uh, anything? No? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I've seen is a, um, is a sensor actually uh, for cattle that resides in the gut and stomach and tracking the temperature, the internal temperature of the cow. So 
very good way to detect disease and the health of the cow before an issue presents so that the farmer can uh, remove the cattle from the herd, preserve the healthy stock, and, and address these issues in advance. Uh, so I've actually heard of some, some pretty staggering increases in production, especially from dairy cows, uh, from, this, from this specific application. You know, the other one was, I've seen two new pasteurization, milk pasteurization technologies. Apparently that's a technology that hasn't changed in about 100 years. Uh, it's probably due for some disruption, but, but not a lot other than that. Well, we could pivot into sustainable protein. Oh, absolutely. Good idea. Yeah, so sustainable protein. So what is, what is protein going to look like in 10, 20 years? Um, so you have everything from sustainable protein, meaning reducing the inputs that go into you know, animal uh, and, and livestock. So using cricket powder, using other types of, of grasses and, and all of that. But then you have the cellular ag level, which is, oh, can, so I talk to ag economists all the time, and they're very doomsday, and we're never going to restore the land. We're never going to solve the issues around uh, ecological restoration. And so some some type of scientists take that and say, okay, well, how else can we how else can we increase animal meat production? Because the trends definitely are around the world. Animal meat consumption is going to increase, even if you reduce, you know, even if you have meatless one day. It's just, you know, and so. <laughs> So in, on the cellular ag, you have people who are creating, you know, meat, creating ground beef um, from stem cells. The origin is still beef, but you no longer need the whole animal to do it. Um, and I don't think anyone's done uh, organs yet. There are a lot of people trying to do the, the breast for chicken, chicken breast. That's the next up and coming thing in cellular ag. So what is what is sustainable protein going to like, look like in 10, 20 years? I, I think that's a really interesting topic. I don't know if anyone else is. About aquaculture. Aquaculture, yeah. So um, I have. Yeah. So aquaculture. So you know. Yeah, aquaponics. Yes, aquaponics. So using um, you have the tilapia fish farming, where you use uh, your whole system is completely uh, net the zero zero waste because the fish uh, the fish process the fish. Um, the fish waste feeds bacteria that feeds the plant, and the plant acts like a filter and grows using the nutrients which are in the clean water back to the fish. Right. Isn't exactly. that pretty much true? <laughs> so what I've seen in terms of investment <laughs> for aquaponics is it really has slowed down. I think that's because um, partially they're just, you still need a certain amount of space to do that, and you still need a certain amount of inputs, and I, I'm not aware of any new technologies that are happening in aquaponics. In terms, but I mean, there's the lighting and the whatnot, but around the whole system. <coughs> Sustainable feed stocks is really important with aquaculture, and we see um, distributed reproduction systems and containers being a big part of that. So, um, just to mention it, that's how we prefer to farm. We actually donate our farm to the school district. Oh, cool. Yeah, so. Containers. Yeah. Question? Well, look, okay. There is a company in San Diego making new probiotics for livestock. Oh, yeah. Want to talk about probiotics? OK. Um, well, let me just kind of hit on a few specific technologies and get our panelists' comments on them. So um, urban farming, I think, is or vertical farming, I think, is like a, one of the really next big things. In fact, in China, it's huge, because they have to do vertical farming. Uh, we saw some LED lighting earlier. Um, those technologies have now come along to where uh, they've gotten to be where they're, they're not using so much power that they're cost prohibitive. Um, so I think the time is soon coming when urban and vertical farming and indoor farming is not just for yuppies in New York City who want fresh tomatoes, uh, but for big cities that need to feed their populations. Any comments on that as a, as a growing sector? Um, absolutely. Uh, we are <laughs> obviously one of those companies and uh, been in the industry for the last couple of years and really watched it grow and evolve from the point where uh, most people, even people in the produce industry, had not heard of indoor farming um, to now it's, it's, it's much more mainstream uh, and companies like ourselves are bringing the technology to a place like Southern California, right, where you don't have 3,500 miles of uh, food cost built into transportation um, and you're really competing year-round uh, directly with outdoor farmers. Um, 
And so investments and developments in the underlying technologies like solid state lighting and LEDs, um, sensor actuator networks, robotics and automation, um, and an increasing body of knowledge around how you can really utilize a tool like that to do something novel, uh, as well as uh, really beginning to break down some of those cultural barriers around the uh, market side. When you can start to talk to large buyers and explain that not only is this a, a fresh and local, more nutritious product, but it grows with, we grow with perfect consistency. You can have that same beautiful leafy green or tomato or cucumber uh, year round. Uh, we can completely eliminate volatility from one of your major cost inputs. Let's talk about what a, a long term contract would look like for this kind of product, and we use those kinds of commitments to finance our expansion. It's really simultaneously envisioning a whole new financial and business model around farming as well as re-envisioning the whole supply chain, when you can relocate those farms to strategic points throughout the existing supply chain, leverage the existing infrastructure, and solve major pain points for large buyers, you can start to make some major changes around how, how food is grown. So I think indoor farming is gonna be one of the ways why we, uh, how we bridge that gulf between the uh, demand and supply side of the uh, uh, deficit we're facing in the next 30 years. What's the scale? So we're we're modular. So we our system we use a 40 bit shipping container. We build all the farms into that, uh, operate them in multi module sites. So two farms for a small community, or 50 to 100 for your U.S. Foods and Cisco's of the world. So for us, we really focus on maximizing the modular economics, so that it doesn't matter what scale you need to deploy at. You really um, we also like to be modular because it lets us centralize our back end supply chain. Get a lot of economy of scale around the manufacturing and production of the system. Uh, the deployment side, most of your costs are fairly linear. So scaling up the size of your system, um, you don't really see too many economy of scale around the cost of goods per unit sold. Question? Yeah. Um, There's a question about ROI. You had mentioned that, mm -hmm. like any business, that's, that's where it's at. I've heard that some of the larger indoor farms, like Aero Farms and Farm here, uh, mm -hmm. are really quite marginal. Um, breaking even. Absolutely. And so the question is, you know, so what's the biggest impediment? I mean, aside from like you could triple your productivity with a different gene or something, uh, just uh, operationally, what are the big impediments to achieving a solid ROI? Well, there's definitely a number of walking dead, as uh, I think they're sometimes called. Um, a lot of the initial initial entries to an industry um, get an initial round of funding, build a facility, um, and don't move on from there. Um, so there's a number of those we already see in the indoor farming space, especially groups that jumped in a couple years ago um, when the technology was not ready. Um, really, at the end of the day, it came down to unit costs for them. The cost of goods sold just could not compete with what was required in the marketplace. And the upfront capital investment in those facilities was massive. So really, you're looking at ROI. So what's the upfront capital? How much can you yield out of it? What's the cost of that yield? What can you sell it at? And does that generate a payback period or return that is financeable or investable. And for most of those first facilities, the answer was a big glaring no. Why? And, uh, oh. high, high capex, you gotta build a, a building and facility. You got to purchase um, an entire hydroponic system, racking, irrigation, airflow, lights are quite expensive. Uh, the lights in the industry a couple years ago were um, not getting quite poor. We tested all of them and decided very quickly to not support a, uh, a viable model. So we ended up designing and engineering our own LED system, and we're now on our fifth generation of lights. Uh, we keep saying improvements in the diode technologies and efficiencies that we can get out of the overall lighting system. And when you start operating in one of those facilities, um, you can really start to optimize how all the systems tie together. So we've learned a lot about what our lights need to do after growing a wide range of props under them and really looking at the total energy balance of the system and not just the uh, watts in, photons out. So I think the just operational experience in the industry is, is still developing. Mm -hmm. um, and we had to completely vertically integrate um, our own engineering team, plant science team, to develop the components we needed to develop a system that could be commercially viable. The only comment I just want to add really quickly from the investment side, so we talked to a lot of, of investment arms, and both from the corporate venture arm and the beast very prominent VCs of what they said about indoor ag is, you know, there's kind of this glass ceiling right now because you can only do it with certain crops, right? You 
knowing you know how much nutrient dense microgreens can you get, how much nutrient dense tomatoes can you get. We're starting to see some innovations in berries, maybe, but you know how many crops are actually going to be worth it at this stage in time? It's still cheaper, and still you're still able to grow other high value crops um, in, the, in the field. And until we get hit that kind of scarcity standpoint with other um, high value crops, you may not see that innovation. I would say we not, might not be as far away <laughs> as some people think. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, absolutely agree. Um, growing microgreens to sell the little foods is great. That's a small business, might be good cash flow. But that's not going to change how we can hold. We need to tackle the large scale, large volume, um, high volume crops. Um, we need to do it in a large way. Just real quickly, like, so, so there's the microgreens and then you have the greens and things like that. You guys are watching for systems. Do you guys focus on the green products? Uh, we, we've done some trials. We don't have any commercial production right now besides the ingredients today. Um, we, we do see, see a lot of opportunities, uh, but we don't have anything commercial on that side today. Rather than being at the mercy of, of the VCs uh, and other investors, you can project finance these things. And I have found that, just like you said, if you can show that it cash flows, um, that's relatively cheap money. What do my accountants say about that? You know? Yeah, we'd agree. I mean, where I sit, I see the competition to the indoor is that the the ability for high yield, great consistent product out of the field is getting better and better and better every day. And so it's a natural competition. But I think, you know, with freight and all the things that have to do with food safety, I think that is going to eventually happen. It's going to be cash flow. Uh, you had a question. Oh, yeah, so just follow up on the, the greenhouse, what percent do you think is energy right now? Uh, of the operating costs? Right. Uh, so for our cells, it depends on the electric that you plug in, but 40 to 60 percent in a lot of geographies. Uh, greenhouses are, are probably comparable, maybe a bit less, depends on the geography they're in. A lot of their cost is heating and cooling versus a closed loop under our lighting system, it's less cooling and more light. <coughs> So it depends on exactly what your system is and where you are and what your cost will just be. You in the back. Um, I think I missed this, but how much uh, do you see at least the rate of adoption of the consumer for the organic label that you have to use? Okay. Buzzword. And even more over, not just the consumer adoption of the organic label, but actually the consumer being deterministic in purchasing a specific crop because of its flavor, its taste. So everybody here in the question that uh, had to do is organic a real thing, are consumers actually buying that? And, and, and how much is it dependent on? What was it? Flavor? Flavor. Yeah. Taste of things. If I could just start with some statistics in terms of um, legal end and so organic, we actually we had another panel discussion about this specific topic last Friday um, for, geared toward consumers. And what I was trying to explain to them is organic in the United States is, is, is very legalese. There's a, there's a definition, you're certified organic or you're not. If you buy organic, it doesn't mean it's pesticide free. There's still organic pesticides and organic chemicals, you know, um, synthetics and, and whatever else. Um, in terms of, of the actual numbers, uh, that, that came out from the organic labeling. It was very lucrative. It's still, I think, the most highest grossing um, label with all the other. Local. Huh? Local. Local, yeah. So local's a little, was higher, um, a little higher. But those two, like, you, then you have the all natural, you know, free range, all of those other mini labels that are not actually regulated. Um, so are the consumers buying it? Yes. They're, you know, they're looking toward the, the dirty dozen, I think. Clean 15, and so they do pay attention to those things. But I think some of the the genetic, the geneticists and the breeders in here know that you know the seed companies really are looking at oh customers really now do want not just yield they are looking at taste again and how do I get that taste back in my tomatoes and and whatever else. So the consumer is starting to drive some of that. You know the genes have always been there. We know what the traits are, but you know actually implementing it into the field. Yeah, you are kind of starting to see. And then the big. Strawberries and Carlsbad, you know, they're dirt clones. You know, there's no 
<laughs> My numbers could be outdated, but I think the growth rate year over year for organic was 13 to 15 percent, I think, and that's been a steady climb. It may have fluctuated a little bit, but it's still going up. Uh, or uh, local, like someone mentioned, is outpacing it. It's going to maybe 20 to 25 percent. Um, I think consumers are beginning to um, become a little bit more educated. I think in some ways about where their food comes from, how it's grown, and why that matters, and beginning to question the organic label a little bit. It's really grown into something that's um, not as scientific as personally I would like it to be. Um, people associate it with uh, quality, um, safe, responsible practices. Uh, but really, it's in, there's an OMRI certified list of inputs, and if you use those inputs, you're organic, and if you're not, you don't, and there's a lot of politics around what's on that list. So there's not really a scientific or biological or, or health reasoning behind the label, but there's a huge consumer association with positive benefits. Um, so I think as that uh, veil slips away, I think that's one of the reasons people are looking to local, is if that farmer's down the street, you know who they are, you have transparency through the supply chain, um, I think there's beginning to be more trust there uh, than what was in the organic label. So I think we might see uh, a bit of some competition between organic and local, but both of them riding the same trend. People want to know where the food came from, how it was grown, is it good for them? And there was it responsible. There was, um, it was just featured on NPR, this topic in terms of um, the, the organic label versus the anti-GMO label, where the anti-GMO label and the organic label, you know, those political, um, they, they, there's a lot of lobbying going around, well, how much is anti-GMO compared to organic? We have a question from a grower. Uh, actually not. Oh, okay, I thought you were. <laughs> but go ahead. I have, so we're, uh, we're working with the Western growers on uh, another um, label, which is 100% sustainable, which is going to be required in the uh, grocery stores. Our product is uh, is basically is a, um, we take post-dated food from the supermarket, transport it into a liquid, and for three hours digest it and sell the farmers that soil. And so it's 100% sustainable um, in terms of the process. Everything that, that um, comes to us goes back to the, in essence, goes back to the supermarket as, a, as, uh, as food. Um, what I actually want, what I, what I got off of the topic is the sustainable is, is clearly another, another label that's going to be uh, one I was wondering, though, know, in terms of financing, um, has any of you, have you seen uh, any um, uh, Regulation A plus type financing, in other words, using the internet to, uh, to finance uh, second stage after you've done friends and family and so forth? I, I can answer that. No. Uh, there's only been a handful of them, and uh, we've looked at Reg 8. This is crowdfunding. It's like a little, it's supposed to be a simplified public offering, uh, but our, uh, and our experience is that it's, it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of work, and we just we just have not seen any. I know there have been a handful of them done out there, but I just don't think it's going to take off, at least not, not in our world. Now, we have seen a lot of crowdfunding, a lot of what they call Title II 506C deals and 506B deals, and that's the new Series A, by the way, is crowd financing through, uh, but that's a whole other topic. But we do have a lot of experience in that. Uh, you're, you're, you're next, but first, uh, we're going to ask your question. Um, okay, yeah. I have a ton of friends who have had diabetes, and it's like no family history, and then there, there's all this information on the internet saying, oh, it's the sugar, but how about the wheat? It's, changed, it's genetically altered, modified, you know, that they're pointing it at that. I, I want to hear what you guys have to say on this, because they're attributing a lot of this to a really dramatic increase in certain health conditions that was never seen before. And maybe you can help answer it. That is a really controversial candidate. I'm just kind of sorry I called on you now. Let me just can I take one? Yeah, I think I have a couple of things to say. Um, so I we brought over a group of food companies from the Netherlands, and we did a panel. We had like 30 of them or 20 of them or something. And we had a VC panel in there, Don, and he's got stood up and said, all you guys care about is making money. He said, you got a huge country, and all you're concerned about is production, and that's why you got a country full of sick people. Don't <laughs> we care more about you know a 
about having food that's not going to make anybody sick and not like, but, but I think the trade-off is if, if you're going to increase production, you know, you're going to have some of the problems you're talking about, which is not really new. I mean, you ever read that book, Sugar Blues? I mean, this whole idea has been around for a long time that the more you process food, the harder it is on your body. It never, never got commercialized. So someone who thinks that their health problems are due to GMO wheat probably think that uh, their vaccines are causing diseases in their children, too. There's no factual basis for it. You've had your hand up for a long time. Go ahead. Well, um, I've been an organic farmer for darn near forever. And I have to tell you that uh, I agree some of the folks were in the back that local has taken on new prominence. But in terms of the damage of the organic label, that's not really happening. There's a lot of talk among pundits about that. But the public keeps increasing the amount of organic they want every year. And I have to tell you, you know, the other half of my persona is a farmer versus running a corporation. <laughs> I can't possibly uh, compare what I'm doing in the corporation to organic food. I have distributors bidding on everything I grow, and I sell every single stick that's sound because, because I'm not going to sell something that's ugly and degrade the market. Uh, and I got to say that organic, as much as it's been maligned in the press, is the public's um, choice, you know, their favorite choice. So what I see is um, there are other technologies. We have genetic technologies, but for instance, when it comes to sorghum, which people are talking about as an energy crop, the USDA has 48,000 varieties of sorghum in its seed bank. Believe me, you can find something there that tailored to what you want without starting over to create a patentable problem. So, we have multiple ways of getting to the goal of feeding more people and making more money. Let's not say that it's only one way that we do have, and we have some market um, demand out there for other ways. So we, we really need to be more open-minded about where research should go and that you know, we don't really know yet if GMO is completely safe. It might turn out to be okay, but we do know the public is concerned. And when it comes to selling my cucumbers, I get two fifty a pound, and the market's only paying a dollar for non-organic. I kind of like that, so I'm willing to do the extra work. <laughs> okay. Thanks for the comments over here, by the way. Oh, Roger, I had an entrepreneurial perspective, and I want to pull you back to your incubator, which okay. is, uh, you know, those four, three types of funding that you have: uh, the crowdfunding, the venture funding, and the uh, corporate uh, investment. Um, as an entrepreneur, I mean, what types of company profiles fit each type of funding? Have you seen, can you segregate or def differentiate the <coughs> type of company that's matched to the type of funding that you would recommend? Um, yeah, that, that, that's a good question for Larry. To <laughs> so so the, the, the typical stage, and we do what we call stage financing. Is your, your, in fact, I have a slide on this to give you the statistics, but you'd be surprised how much of, of the first funding is just founder money. Founders put way more money into their companies than I think people realize. And then, of course, it's friends and family, and that's going to go in, as Larry said, as convertible debt, typically. Uh, the average size of that is uh, it's a couple hundred thousand dollar range. Um, the, uh, the next stage, and the idea is you want to get enough money to take you to another valuation point, so you don't give away too much in your company. And the next stage, of course, is uh, what we call the price round. Um, although we're seeing convertible debt rounds, so that's just you invest in debt that will convert into equity, or to equity that converts into priced equity at some later time when the institutions come in. 
uh, we're seeing convertible debt rounds. They're quite sizable now. I mean, I, 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 we did, in fact, I did one that's $10 million, you know, not priced. But typically, once you get beyond a million or $2 million, you see a price drop, and that's stock. And that's where the institutions come in. So that's, but that's not just ag tech, that's everything. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, I want to bring it back to ag tech topics. And you and I can talk more about this aspect um, actually in five minutes when we finish <laughs> Um, in terms of profiles, I, I deal a lot with our corporate venture arms and um, what they're really looking for. So, you know, a lot of people will come to me and say, Erica, why, why is a big company going to, why don't they just spend the money and develop that themselves, take the research, develop it themselves? It's, well, you know, it's a time cost issue when we just acquire it and you know, use it. They, we, when, when corporate venture arms come to us, they're looking for very specific things. Um, but they're looking for very specific things to apply to their pipeline, usually about five years out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they've worked on the, on the food and the ag side, you know, they're already doing, they've already done most of their trials, they're 10 years into whatever pipeline, now they're looking to bring in a technology for a specific reason. And so, uh, when startups pitch to them, you know, they're like, oh, when we're in these meetings, they're like, oh yeah, I think we could apply it to X, Y, or Z, but we'll have to talk to, to those product pipeline, you know, and see if it will fit. So if you're gonna go corporate venture, that, that's something that I've noticed. Way better answer than mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a question, but <clears throat> actually maybe I think, uh, in, in tech startup, we see that uh, a common option is, is build a company that can be sold, and Salesforce it was an obvious target. And Salesforce built out a platform. There was a huge market for it. Build a niche that you knew, you planned it out 18 months, you can turn it over and sell it to Salesforce and create it. Um, what we've kind of seen, so uh, my company, we do uh, custom development. We follow um, internet things real close. And one of the large ones is uh, PTC. Uh, they own like 25% of the internet of things stuff that's being built. And one of their sweetheart companies is John Deere. And John Deere has, served, has, has really uh, transitioned their company into as a service. So they're really selling crops as a service. That's the only example that I know of, of, of something that's kind of in that space of going from what they used to call big, dumb, green metal into crops as a service. I was wondering if you see, that that's that's my realm of what I know of internet and things in ag tech. Do you see other things like that coming out in, I don't know, that, that, is there another direction that we haven't seen? Yeah, I think, I think. Deer is like one of the biggest purveyors of agricultural technology in the country. We've seen a tractor lately. Um, you know, it's, it's all technology. In fact, a lot of the companies that we work with, they, they sell to those sorts of manufacturers, just the, the accessories and the add-ons and the sensors and the, and the systems that are analyzing data that's gonna make it all talk to each other. And we could go on for an hour about, about those technologies. Um, so uh, I guess your question is, are the manufacturers, is it crops as a service? I had I'd never heard that. I want to think about that a little bit. I like that mm -hmm. idea because it's kind of getting that way. Any comments here? Okay. You're going to get the last word, Erica. So I think what you're, what you're, well, what my answer to you back is, you know, if you look at like, if you compare John Deere, they're much more like Apple than they are Google. John Deere is all about closed systems. When they take their technologies, it's for John Deere and it's for John Deere tractors. Um, we're starting to see other companies that want to play with everybody um, on the on the main. So you know, do you get into exclusive versus non-exclusive? I think that's kind of the big philosophical question. And you will you um, the 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 non-exclusive players um, usually end up just doing joint licenses. By the way, the legal issue. <laughs> uh, to, to conclude this, you might have read about this, is that, you know, in the old days, because uh, I had a, we had a tractor when I was a kid, and if something went wrong with your tractor, you went and fixed your tractor. If you do that today, you are infringing somebody's copyright, and you could be sued. <laughs> so that's the new world that we live in, with John Deere tractors, and Deere will take that position. So, um, you know, with that, we're at 8 o'clock. I, I know that all our pitch companies are still here, and are, would be happy to chat more with you folks, our panel on expecting to stick around. I really want to thank this audience. It was really interactive. It was good to get some, you know. <laughs>